Welcome to the Filmlinks Podcast, a narrated podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 135, Wilder, Not Wilder. But who's on first? <laughs> well, Wilder is up first, and we're talking about the, this month and next month we'll be talking about two of the great Golden Age directors, uh, Billy Wilder and William Wyler, who have very distinct uh, careers, but both in the same time period, both at the top of their game. Uh, and they do get mixed up, even in professional circles. So we're going to talk about them at the same time and uh, see what that does for us mixing them up. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, up first, yeah. we've got Billy Wilder. Yeah, they're kind of in that range of directors who worked a lot during that time period, um, were very successful but kind of came before uh, directors were big kind of household names and they kind of experienced some of that renaissance during the sixties and seventies when people started celebrating our tour theories and oh, yeah. along with like people like, um, Oh gosh, something Hawks, Howard Hawks, Howard uh, Hawks. Yeah. Along Orson with him, Wells, Hitchcock. Orson Wells, Hitchcock, other people who had been like really popular, really good directors, within Otto the Preminger, film community be itself. Today. Yeah, he's he's in here. Uh, they then they then became famous kind of after their the height of their career. Otto Primager kind of reached into the 60s and was making stuff there as well and I think uh Weiler also worked fairly long into the 60s and I think he had one, maybe one movie in the 70s. But the the point is that they kind of come from that same generation of directors who were Mostly just working directors and big names within the industry, but maybe not big household names at the time. Uh, they also come from a generation of immigrant directors, as we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, so Billy Wilder was born in 1906 in Austria-Hungary, in part of what is now Poland. Um, and his Yiddish name at birth was Samuel Wilder. Uh, eventually he started going by Billy at a fairly young age, actually. Uh, his family owned a small cake shop in a train station, which sounds so like whimsical and quaint where he <laughs> grew up and tried, uh, they tried to get Billy to join in the cake shop business. He wasn't really having it though. And they moved to Vienna and he became a journalist where he met a famous jazz band leader named Paul Whiteman in 1926. Whiteman took him to Berlin with the band. If you know anything about Berlin during the twenties, the 1920s, not the right now twenties, um, then you know, like if you've seen cabaret or something, then you know it's um, it was a wild and crazy place. Uh, it, lots of artists moving in lots of circles at once. In Berlin, he worked as what was called a taxi dancer, which if you don't know what that is, it's essentially a uh, it could be a woman, but mostly dudes uh, who would be in a play, a dance hall of some sort and essentially were paid by the dance to dance with various women. So a woman would go to the, the place alone and pay a taxi dancer to dance with her. Um, that sounds like they would make an app for that nowadays. You probably could <laughs> like an like Uber, but for dancing. Yeah, uh, actually, I think that's just Tinder. Um, Pretty much. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, he was moving in those artistic kind of like bohemian esque circles and making connections in the entertainment industry. During this time, he kind of he already had experience as a journalist. So he was working as a crime and sports stringer at a local newspaper until he caught a job at a Berlin tabloid, uh, which starred his interest in film specifically. And in 1929, he collaborated with other novices, kind of in the same range, those that artistic community, people who wanted to get into film, and made a movie called People on Sunday, which aired in 1929, uh, which was his first film ever and first film as a writer. Uh, he worked on many other silent pictures as a screenwriter up until 1933 in Germany. Uh, when Hitler rose to, to power, the very Jewish Wilder got the heck out of Dodge to Paris and made his directorial debut with a movie called Mave Grain. I, I don't know how many much of that to pronounce because it's French. Who knows? Uh, in 1934. And he moved to Hollywood before the movie was even released. His mother, and this part's really sad, so content warning. Uh, his mother, stepfather, and grandmother were all separated and murdered during the Holocaust. Uh, but yeah, And then after, after the Holocaust, he was commissioned by um, the United States as part of uh, 
some of the directors in that time period that we've talked about, like uh, Capra, even Weiler, that we're going to talk about next month. Yeah. Um, but he was commissioned to make films for German audiences showing the uh, the atrocities of the concentration camps. And he would go through, he had footage that he had taken going through the concentration camps and they would air it. They would like air it right after movies uh, in German theaters to make them watch it. And they would give them like notepads um, to write down their reactions, but no one would do it. And they just stole, <laughs> he, he says, they stole all the pencils, but not not a single form was filled out. And so after that, he would just kind of work some of those themes um, of the war crimes that he saw into his films like uh, Foreign Affair and uh, some of the ones we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. His filmmaking does get a little heavier after the war. Um, anyway, in Hollywood in the 30s, uh, he, uh, he continued working mostly as a screenwriter and eventually naturalized as an American in 1939, gaining his first big success in Hollywood writing Ninochka, which I think, I don't know if we covered it directly, but we covered Ernst we Lubitsch yeah. on, uh, on a, on a uh, recent episode, in the, within the past two years at least. Uh, Lubitsch is going to be very important because Lubitsch was one of Billy Wilder's mentors, and he's the one that the famous line, um, how would Lubitsch do it, comes from. He had that uh, like handwritten in, in a script uh, and framed in his office, how would Lubitsch do it? Uh, and so mm-hmm. that was kind of his his lens that he viewed all his films through is is how did Lubitsch go about portraying very sensitive human drama and it shows through very strongly in the films we're talking about today. He uh, experienced continued uh, success collaborating with fellow writer Charles Brackett, who uh, I don't it, judging by some of the quotes didn't entirely love working with uh, Wilder, but found some success with it anyway. Uh, they worked on movies like Hold Back the Dawn and Ball of Fire from 1942. And eventually, Wilder would go on to have his American directorial debut in the same year with uh, The Major and The Minor, which was a, su- a success as well. Double Indemnity in 1944, a movie by Wilder as well, uh, cemented his status as a top-tier director within the industry and established lots of the conventions of film noir, um, so much so that we've already talked about this film. Yeah, on the see episode show as 71. Well. Shameless yeah, plug. I think we're, we're, we're really getting uh, super recursive this year. It's just <laughs> going to get more and more recursive. I know. It's no way to avoid it. Uh, but yeah, it established a lot of the elements of film noir, such as uh, voiceover, which is very popular in a lot of Wilder films, and Venetian blind lighting. It also represents a major pushback against Hollywood censorship and thinking about some of the things kind of like outlaid in that film. Yeah, of course it did. And Wilder had a tendency to butt heads with censorship. Uh, some believe this to be the first true film noir, combining Citizen Kane's aesthetics with Maltese Falcon stories. Um, and he tried to work on it with the original novel writer Raymond Chandler, but they didn't really click. Um, which is, again, not surprising. Wilder doesn't seem like the guy who collabs as well as he works above or below people super well. Seems more like a hierarchical guy. He did anyway, have he one writer that, that he worked with for a long time, and uh, they seem to have had a very fruitful career. I'm trying to remember his name. It's like I, IAL Diamond. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, they seem to have gotten along pretty well. Uh, and he adapted another book, The Lost Weekend, in 1945, which, if you don't know much about that movie, it's about alcoholism and maybe one of the first films in Hollywood to really, really portray alcoholism. Like there would be characters who would be considered alcoholic and mo- or lushes, as they might be called in uh, films before that. But you kind of follow the rules of uh, Hollywood censorship. You could show someone drinking or you could show someone drunk, but you couldn't show someone drinking to and becoming drunk. Yeah, uh, it's very, very weird. It's like how you can't show like the bullet hitting somebody in the same screen. Right. As the gun being fired, which he pushes uh, all of those in these films that we're talking about. Oh, he does. Yeah, he is not one to uh, to balk at censors. Uh, but anyway, the Lost Weekend uh, hit Hollywood censors again, like we just said, and won lots of awards, both with the uh, both at the Oscars and the Cannes Film Festival, and kind of cemented Wilder as not just a star within the American film industry, but within the film industry internationally. 
And of course, at this point, if you were a star within the film industry, unless you were an actor, you probably weren't known anywhere besides within the film industry. <laughs> but that is a certain level of success and status that gets, lets you kind of do more and more on your own individually. And then we start getting into the bevy of films that we're going to talk about today, and most of which mark kind of the high points of Wilder's career at its peak, which are Jonathan. Yeah, we're talking about Sunset Boulevard from 1950, an extremely meta film uh, starring Gloria Swanson and William Holden uh, with Eric von Stroheim. Uh, all of those are very important names. Fun fact, the first film studio in Hollywood opened on Sunset Boulevard, which was Nestor Studios. Um, so this is a very self-aware film about Hollywood, uh, which we'll get into in a moment. And then we're following that up with Stalag 17, from 1953, a World War II film, again starring William Holden uh, and starring Otto Preminger, who was, as we said, a uh, Golden Age director par excellence in his own right. Um, and Also a bit of a psychopath, but that's neither here nor there <laughs> right now. We'll do a Preminger episode someday. I know, I was just thinking, we gotta do a Preminger. Um, based on the Broadway play written by Donald Bevan and Edmund Trzinski who uh, were actual prisoners in Stalag 17 during the war. Uh, and then we'll be watching, or we'll be, yeah, we'll be watching. They make, we'll a, they make about... a cameo in Stalag 17, actually, as, uh, oh, as soldiers. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Um, uh, and then we'll be talking about Sabrina from 1954, starring Audrey Hepburn, William Holden again, you guessed it, uh, and Humphrey Bogart. And then we'll be talking about The Apartment from 1960, starring Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine, Inspired by Noel Coward's uh, screenplay for Brief Encounter, which was directed by David Lean, which we have brought up several times on the podcast already, um, even though we've never actually talked about that film in full. Um, but it's also inspired by a scandal where a Hollywood agent was shot by a producer for sleeping with his wife. Uh, so that gives you a taste of what The Apartment's going to be all about. Man, I love The Apartment. The Apartment is such a good movie. The <sighs> Apartment is... is it's so many things. Oh man. It really yeah. is. There's going to yeah, be a lot. It's like to a sub nation of like a period it's in and a preview of the period that it will be in. Uh, it's so perfect that it came out in 1960 because it actually, a lot of the apartment serves as the inspiration for Mad Men, the TV show, which is really good. Mm, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot of stuff. And also like just fun filming's fact, it's probably the first, um, so when I was I was 16, I printed out a, a list of like older movies to watch, and I just went to the local family video. Jonathan, you remember the family video? Oh yeah. Uh, where, and I just looked at the list and started looking for ones, and the first one I found was The Apartment, and I rented it, and I hadn't seen many old movies, but I watched it, and I was like, "This is amazing! This this is so good!" And I decided to watch making. more older. Yeah, I started to uh, I decided to watch more older films after that. Uh, but yeah, it's one of the first like older films that I really had an interaction with. Um, All right, let's get into uh, these movies. Uh, Jason, tell us about Sunset Boulevard. Sunset Boulevard from 1950. Joe is a screenwriter down on his luck. His stories won't sell, he's running out of money, and the car company is looking to repo his car. After yet another script rejection, he's forced to flee with his car to Sunset Boulevard, hiding from the repo men among the oversized mansions of Hollywood's royalty. It just so happens that the dilapidated 1920s villa he hides out in is still occupied by an aging silent film queen looking to mount a return. Norma Desmond hires Joe to prune her 600-page script down to something more manageable for famed director Cecil B. DeMille. But DeMille and the world have moved on, while Desmond is stuck in a dream of the past, one that threatens to drag Joe into its silvery embrace as well. So, speaking of fun facts about, you know, how we watched old movies, I watched Sunset Boulevard after I read The Disaster Artist. Did you ever read The Disaster Artist, Alex? I listened to the audiobook. <laughs> okay, so, I, I don't know if they do it in the audiobook, but every chapter in the book starts with either a quote from Sunset Boulevard or, um, oh gosh, what's the, uh, the talented Mr. Ripley. Um, I mean, they're both the perfect analogy for, um, really good analogies for this, uh, for this movie. Right. It's like, it's, it's or for, like, or for, uh, dis for disaster. For Tommy was Tommy was so life. Yeah. It's, it's on the one hand, 
this uh, self-obsessed thinks- narcissist and on the other hand, like a, a psychopath, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, he thinks he's Sunset Boulevard, but really he's the talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah, basically. Um, he and actually, an the talented Mr. Ripley star, was the film that made him want to make uh, The Room. Um, but anyway, we're not talking about The Room. That's one of the rules. <laughs> uh, Sunset Boulevard, Alex, is a great movie, and it is uh, it is so self-aware, but also meta in every fiber of its creation, down to Gloria Swanson, down to Eric von Straheim, down to Billy Wilder. is It's a reflection of Hollywood in a a dirty and faded mirror. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's a it's an important reminder that at this point in time, by the time the 50s had rolled around, there had already been a few generations of Hollywood. It's a pretty quickly changing industry that moves pretty fast. And unless you're... Uh, People behind the ha- camera actually have a tendency to stick around longer than people in front of the camera, too, mm-hmm. almost for the reasons you see in this movie. Um, and it's also interesting that this is basically like the last moment that this film could have been made. You know, the whole point of it is that is that the the film industry is is aging and there's like this old old Hollywood and the new shiny Hollywood, um, which, you know, even looking back on it, uh, it, it still kind of has this dynamic, but you could not have made this film literally with some of the greatest um, filmmakers and film stars from that old Hollywood time period, you know, a decade or two later, because they would not have been able to actually be in it. So the fact that this film was made when it was made, that it was so self-aware that the people who oh, are yeah. part of the era that it's commenting on are actually being part of the commentary is kind of amazing. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's very much a product of its time. I do think that this is one of those movies, kind of like, almost kind of like a Star Is Born, that might work pretty well as like a retelling by the uh, by the decade or by the every couple decades of sorts, because Hollywood changes so much. Like twenty years yeah. after this, Hollywood in the seventies was super different. And twenty years after that, with big blockbuster Hollywood, it was different as well. Yeah. And 20, 20 years now, you could argue that Hollywood might be kind of dead. Uh, <laughs> hot takes. It's been a while uh, since we've had some hot take soup, but it's getting colder outside. It's been a while um, since Hollywood was a serious industry. Um, you could also make the argument, just the last meta note before I really dive into this film, Jonathan. You could also make the argument that Hollywood's return to its roots of just assembly line mass producing crap. And just shoveling it out like the early silent days instead of uh, trying to make stuff of higher quality. Um, But that's neither here nor there. I'm just going to sip this tea. (laughs) Um, Metaphorically, I actually have coffee. But anyway, by the time Wilder moved to Hollywood, many of the big mansions on Sunset Boulevard were actually still occupied in fashion similar to, if not quite as dark as Norma Desmond in the movie. Uh, perhaps mm-hmm. the most notable of which was Mary Pickford, who operated kind of as a studio head, but also kind of as a shut in for like 30 years after her last movie in the early 1930s and kind of would have been shut up at the same time that this movie was made and came out. Yeah. Um, and another uh, movie star, which was actually the first pick for the film was Mae West, um, who didn't oh, want Mae West to would have... never do this movie, though. <laughs> she didn't want to be involved with it. Um, and it's kind of amazing that Gloria Swanson did because, I mean, the, the, the and this is something that we'll, we'll need to discuss, but the film is simultaneously like a critique and a redemption for um, Norma Desmond. Like it's it's both showing showing the the kind of patheticness of this kind of a backwards looking life and mind frame, but also it's kind of a glorification of this time that was and this, you know, this era that's gone and the the kind of glory days, if you will. Um, and just to kind of bring in all the all the interesting stuff. So in the film, you have Norma Desmond and the uh, her butler chauffeur, everything who is played by Eric von Stroheim, who in the film it, it, we, it is revealed that he was her first husband that she cast aside. 
Um, and also, he was one of her first directors. And Eric von Straheim was actually one of the directors of um, Gloria Swanson in the silent era. And the film that they watch in her house, um, which is uh, Queen Kelly, um, was directed by Eric von Straheim, starring her as one of the last films. I think she did like two films after that, but it was one of the last films she did before Sunset Boulevard um, and before Billy Wilder kind of got her uh, got her back into the the limelight. Um, so mm-hmm. again, this film is like everything it's saying, it's saying with like the utmost authority. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's lots of little uh, stuff laid around in this um, in this in this movie that's all connected to and lots of trivia and basically Easter eggs is what we call it in modern parlance. Mm-hmm. But it's all just based off of real Hollywood history. Uh, the other wild thing about this movie, Jonathan, and I think it's only accomplished because uh, Billy Wilder was so experienced at this point and so um, adept at being a writer first and then a director afterwards, he mm-hmm. multiclassed, if you will, um, is that this movie was barely written. <laughs> they, they wrote like, they had like a third of the script written, like literally just the first act. And then they started when they started shooting, which is wild. And yeah. so a lot of it is interesting because Billy Wilder did not improv. like improvising. He didn't like doing it that way. But yeah, some of these like we'll like see it, this. But it's it's weird because he, he, it sounds like looking through some of the other production histories of some of his films, this is not the only time it's happened. It, right. it happened. So Same with Sabrina. I kind of have. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of have this uh, this this impression that it's one of those things where. Billy Wilder was like, I don't like shooting without a finished script. But why do you do it every time, Wilder? I don't know. That's just how I work. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. So it just happens I, every time. There's a, um, on the Criterion channel, there's an extra, which is like three hours worth of this BBC documentary um, by uh, uh, Walker Schlondorf, um, who is another German director. Uh, that, yes, Schlondorf. Yes, who, who uh, was another German director that had correspondence with Billy Wilder and stuff. And then he sat Billy Wilder down and, and made this whole thing. Um, and in that Billy Wilder (laughs) talks about the difference between, uh, like, like shooting completely off the cuff. Like he says, uh, Cassavetes would do, um, versus Fritz Lang, who he (laughs) almost was like ridiculing saying Fritz Lang is there at like 4am in the morning. He's got six different colored chalks and he's going around on the floor and saying, okay, Mark one, and we go over to the coffee table, Mark two, and then we take a different color for the next character, and here's Mark one, and he's got the entire thing mapped out, and it makes everything very robotic. So Billy Walters was like some kind of blend of complete <laughs> improv. Robotic. And like, I get it. Metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> Metropolis. <laughs> um, but it's a blend of of being like Hitchcockianly planned and being completely off the cuff. Uh, so he he had some wiggle room in there. I, I like it, and I also like how much it's just like a coworker ragging on another coworker. Like you I won't know. believe how Fritz does his job. That's he gets really these what, chocks. He buys when you so read much these chalk, interviews with old directors. That's all it is. It's just them talking about all their it's, friends from the past. It's so catty. It's so catty. I love every second of it. It's super catty. Um, but it's also like a great example, like a uh, like ring cut of a tree sample of like how work was done back then. It also like humanizes the process a lot to just reveal that like, oh, yeah, they're not necessarily like <sighs> geniuses because they were born different. They're they were good at it because they were out there at 4 a.m. doing their thing or they've shot so right. many movies that they can shot shoot off the cuff. Um, I know that like the production cycle of movies has changed over the years. And that's not something that's going to change again in the near future, I don't think. But, you know, it used to be that you got so much experience shooting because you were shooting two to three movies a year. And now directors make like one movie every three to five years, basically. Um, And so part of me wonders, like, what would be different if they got even more experience making movies to what 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 effect that would have on their filmmaking process? Um, you know who does get that much experience doing movies? Everyone who's in the franchise films, they're pumping, <laughs> they're pumping out like yeah. a film a year or more. Everyone who's in a franchise film, or actually more importantly, everybody on set. 
Those are the people yeah, who have like true. crazy, crazy, crazy. They've grinded out so many skill levels in the thing you they have do. To tell them what to do. No, they probably know it before the director shows up. And in fact, I'm actually I worry sometimes because I see that in my work in in TV, which honestly, like it's nothing fancy. I'm not bragging or anything. I work on an assembly line, uh, but I see that that dissonance between people who are so experienced. And do so much in one day that they can just intuitively make these decisions. And then people who are in the decision making power who positions who take so long to make one decision because they haven't had as much experience making yeah. decisions. And it, it, the dissonance there makes me worry for the quality of the product and the future of the work. But anyway, that all that to bring it back around is to say, like, this is the benefit of being a working director like Billy Wilder, like. He just went out there and was just making movies and making movies and making movies because he was in a system that benefited from making a lot of movies really fast and gave him lots of money to do it. Yeah. Um, and so he just got really, really good at it. He, the reason he's such a competent writer and he could pull off something like starting off Sunset Boulevard with a third of a script is because he had decades of experience and everyone working with him had decades of experience doing very high level competent work. Right. All right. Um, so, so let's, let's dig- turn it into the movie a little Deeper. Yeah, okay, I was going to do the same. Because these these noir films are so reliant on the characters and the darkness, and it's it's this film has so many layers to what we're supposed to think of um, William Holden's character, which is the first time that Billy Wilder had worked with him. And Man, we're going to see a lot of William of his, Holden today. Yeah, quickly became one of Wilder's favorite actors um, to work with. Uh, but also, like I said, there's... I've already kind of got into the the complex relationship between uh, like the audience and also Billy Wilder as a director in terms of portraying Gloria Swanson. But William William Holden's character is like even crazier because he is in this this web of of like narcissism and hedonism. And like he he knows he wants all this like money and he wants to be around all the, the nice stuff. Um, he doesn't want to have to, you know, work for anything, but he also likes the, the, um, the really nice girl and I think he struggles with it until he just doesn't. Yeah. I think the poetic thing about his character arc is that his relationship, uh, you know, it's very easy to look at this movie and see how in love with the older version of Hollywood Norma Desmond is. But also William Holden's character is just as in love with this idea of Hollywood as she is. And when he falls in love with quote air quotes on falls in love, but yeah. falls into this world of Norma Desmond's old Hollywood, he's falling into this dream of Hollywood and existing in Hollywood that he wasn't getting to experience anymore. And so he was falling into that web of desire, not just for money or comfort necessarily, but that was his chance to experience the golden age of Hollywood and live in this uh, this fantasy world that doesn't really exist in real life, but exists on screen or exists in the, the papers of like this fantasy of what it's like to be in Hollywood. I mean, after all, they very pointedly make him a transplant, right? Which is the people right. who dream so much of Hollywood that they move across the country to be in L.A. and be in Hollywood. And he's one of the things he's scared about, most scared about in the movie and the thing that drives him to stay over and over is not necessarily running out of money. He's like, I don't want to go back to Ohio. I I don't yeah. want to give up on this dream of Hollywood. And so his dream of Hollywood ends up manifesting itself inside of Norma Desmond and her like weird web that she's got going on. So she's fooling herself and she's fooling William Holden. And then William Holden, Holden's character is fooling himself at the same time that he's being fooled by her. Um, it's all very poetic. Yeah, yeah and there's Whereas another the, layer too, though, that I think because William Holden is a cynic at the beginning and he wants to be a good writer. Um, but by falling into this trap of looking back at the golden age of Hollywood, he just keeps like rehashing this one script. That's not very good and not, it it never goes anywhere. Um, so he never, there's, there's also like this element where he kind of realizes that he's not going to be able to make it as a writer in the real Hollywood. So he can pretend like he's a good writer with, uh, Norma Desmond in her fantasy Hollywood. Very much so. Very much so. And at the same time, when we look at his relationship with the, um, I don't remember character names, uh, but the good girl, the, the nice girl, the, the, the nice girl, um, 
who is also his like friend's fiance. It's really weird. Uh, but of course it's sorted and weird. It's a noir. Yeah. Uh, but if we look at his relationship with her, it's centered around Betty. something that's actually closer to the reality of Hollywood, which is late nights of working hard on a new script. Yeah. Um, that they're not sure is going to sell, but it's the actual work of Hollywood rather than the weird romantic idea of work that was being presented within Norma Desmond's uh, mansion, or maybe a more accurate description would be a uh, dungeon. Um, right. On there. I also like that. Do, do we know it? Was that actually Cecil B. DeMille in this movie? Uh, yeah, I am 90% sure. Everyone else is legit, so I don't think they would have called it Cecil. They would have called him Cecil B. DeMille if it wasn't. Because they've got Buster Keaton. They've got... Um, they do have know, Buster Keaton. Uh, oh, yep, Cecil B. DeMille right there as himself. Yeah, he so, was into making the epics at that point in time. He was making stuff like Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah. He's... Uh, again, we're going to have to do an episode on... DeMille. There's so much golden age that we haven't even touched on. Like, y'all think we talk about old movies a lot? There's so much to nah, do. <laughs> we're going to talk about old movies. Just um, you watch. No, nobody else is going to do it, so we're going to do it. Right. Um, so I, I do kind of want to bring up this. Um, there's an element to the fact that this movie is, like, hard-boiled. So we talked about Double Indemnity, which is, you know, like, like Alex said, one of the ultimate hard-boiled noirs. Um, but Billy Wilder's strength was really in his comedies, um, but he knew where the line was. He knew what he knew how to make the film that he was trying to make. So this film originally had an alternate opening scene. Have you researched this, Alex? I have not. What was the original opening scene? So the original opening scene was this is so weird. I can't even imagine it, Um, but it starts in a morgue and all the bodies are being carted in. Um, and then it like has a close up on the, on the toe, the big toe with the toe tag, uh, it says like John Doe. And then after the mortician leaves and all the lights turn off, then all the bodies like sit up on the table and William Holden's character like fixes his name tag on his big toe. And then he starts to, and then they all start like telling the story of how they died or something like that. And then William Holden's character you know goes into his whole story which makes sense why this story is being narrated by the character who we see dead in the first two seconds of the film but the problem was when they screened it people would start laughing at the toe tag um because it was so comical and and billy wilder he liked the opening but he realized you can't start a film off this that a film this dark off with a laugh because then you're setting up the audience for uh False expectations. Um, you can put laughs in it, but you can't start the first scene with a laugh. No, 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 no. Actually, there's a there's a there's a big theory in uh, writing that I found some novelist talking about last year. I can't remember who. I wish I did. Uh, oh, I do remember now. It was Brandon Sanderson. Uh, that dude talks uh, a lot. Just makes so many. Just writes so many books. I've never. Speaking of people who just work. And just yeah. do the work like enough, like they level grind up their ability basically by just doing it five million times. Brandon Sanderson like generates like multiple epic sized fantasy books a year. So, like, yeah, it's not crazy. small books either. These are not no. dime, dime shelf books. Yeah. <laughs> Big like you, each book could be a murder weapon as a paperback. Like it's they're they're ridiculous. But anyway, one of the things he, he talks about with writing is that you have to set up even if you're going to have a twist in your film. You have to set up the tone of everything, including the twist or whatever the surprise ending is within like the first 5%, five pages or whatever of your story. Like if you're going to have a twist at the end that's dark or comical, you have to hint at that really fast. You have to set up the expectations clearly. And I've talked about this before too when it comes to how I rate movies. And you might see me talking about that if you follow in the Discord and look at the uh, mini reviews where I just watch a bunch of movies and review them really fast. You can even put movies in the suggestion box and I will watch them and review them for you. Uh, But I talk about how I like to rate movies based on uh, the rubric that the movie sets up for itself. So the movie has to set up its own rubric. It sets up its own goals. And if it achieves that, then it's good. 
Like, if a movie just sets out to be big, dumb fun and does that really well, that's a near-perfect movie in my book. If a movie sets out to be um, a big, dumb, fun blockbuster but also have, like, some deeper meaning of life that's supposed to be really revelatory to the audience and falls flat on its face in accomplishing that, it's going to be rated much lower. Um, but, yeah, that's really We talked about this, too, important. in our first episode with uh, Spielberg. Spielberg sets up every film. The first scene is a microcosm for the rest of the film in almost yeah, every yeah. instance. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So The three-act structure folding in on itself repeatedly. Right. And, again, like, Billy Wilder is a master of comedy, but he knows where to use it and where not to use it. Um, exactly. And that so, was a good choice. And I really like the opening to this if for no other reason, Jonathan, then the opening reminds me of the end of Great Gatsby. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. that's actually dude, pretty darn accurate. Some dude pretending at being rich. Yeah. Or getting rich through, like, maybe not the most straightforward or A-OK -okay methods ends up dead in a pool. Yeah. And there is this, again, it's almost like, like he's half cheating on everything. Like he's not fully committed to anything that he's going after. And that's the problem. And by the time that he actually makes his firm decision, it's too late. And that's his downfall. Yeah. Now the question is, is Norma Desmond redeemed in any way? Like what, what is the fate of Norma Desmond? Uh, honestly, I think she's headed for like a, a psychiatric hospital <laughs> at the end of this movie. Um, but I can't imagine 1950s LA judicial system putting her anywhere other than a psych ward. But, um, yeah, I mean, she gets exactly what she wants is the thing. Yeah, she does. She, she didn't care about how she got it. She just wanted to be a star again and now she has everyone paying attention to her oh man i love that final scene too that what a great like high tower surprise to throw at the end like she won't come downstairs the police want to get her downstairs and the only way to do it is to fully indulge this fantasy of hers yeah give her actually everything she wanted she's so happy at the end it's hard it's hard to count that truly as a loss for her and that last uh, shot where she melds into the camera looking straight into it and just like blur dissolves into the audience. I mean, she says all that matters is those people in the dark out there. And then she walks straight out to us. Yeah. What a good ending, right? Like looping yeah. the people watching the movie into it. Oh, man. I want to. OK, last thing before we move off, I want to throw out because um, we, we have talked about this back when we covered Ida Lupino. And a, there's an episode of The Twilight Zone that Ida Lupino starred in called 16 Millimeter Shrine, which is almost identical to this film, just like yes. in a very consolidated format where she's so obsessed with her old Hollywood career. She watches her films over and over again until The Twilight Zone like absorbs her into her films and she disappears from the real world, um, which, which is, is the like happiest the perfect, thing that could happen to her. <laughs> I know, which is like. Exactly what happens here, except, you know, this is in a much more dramatic, Not the noir. Just the happiest. No, but, like, this is a thing. And Ida Lupino was a great choice for that, too, because she came from a classic Hollywood um, background. And, you know, at that point when she uh, was in that episode, she was kind of at the end of that. So, you know. This story is not like isolated. This is a thing that Hollywood has to deal with every so often. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, just a quick trivia fact. You know, they actually had to. Um... Oh man, why am I forgetting her? Gloria Swanson. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, they actually had to do work to make her look older because she had taken such good care of her face because she was a Hollywood star. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever, and I think she wasn't seen... even she wasn't super old when they made this either. No, no, yeah. not in the slightest. She was like I think like in her fifties, like late late forties, some... early fifties, something yeah, like something that. Like, like not not truly old. And the character of uh, the character of Norma Desmond isn't really old either. She's just in her fifties. Mm -hmm. uh, but also something something to contextualize the time frame is that you know actresses didn't really work that yeah. far into their 40s at this point in time. There are some exceptions who managed to make that transition, but even like the role of uh, the, the list of available roles for actresses past a certain age were very different. Um, you know, you didn't have romantic leads over a certain age or anything like that. So 
And I would it, hardly it, call this a romantic lead, although. <laughs> no, 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 no. But that that's just that's just what I'm talking about when it comes right. to like the character of Norma Desmond. Like at this point in time, it, you essentially aged out of Hollywood's good graces as a woman past a certain point. All right, so I think we should move on from Sunset. Jason, set up Stalag 17. Stalag 17, from 1953. Stalag 17, a German POW camp, holds 630 American Air Force sergeants on the Danube during World War II. Nearly all of them want to escape, and some are bold enough to try, but lately those attempts have ended in tragedy, and the men of barracks number four suspect that they have a rat in their mists. Suspicion immediately falls on the cynical, scheming acquisitions man, J.J. Sefton, no one's favorite guy, and one who bets regularly against the odds of escape. When a lieutenant arrives, one whose life is threatened by info the mysterious rat is giving up, it's up to Sefton to prove his innocence by finding the real culprit, someone who might not even be American at all. Alright, we are in Stylic 17, which is really a mystery. I wasn't really expecting it to be, but... Billy Wilder, like, loves mysteries. Like we said, he worked with Raymond Chandler. He also had um, a fondness for Agatha Christie. I think he actually talked about how, like, Agatha Christie was really good at writing really intricate plots, but her dialogue was never quite as great. But he really liked Raymond Chandler's dialogue. So I think he tried to blend those. Um, and that makes you sense. see that, like, Sunset Boulevard, Double Indemnity are mysteries. Uh, Style like 17 is like an Agatha Christie, you know, we've got a set number of people in this little bunker. One of them is the guy. We've got to figure out who it is. Mm -hmm. Very murder on the Orient Express. Very much so. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty mysterious, mysterious mystery. But like, what if we set it in a POW camp in World War II, which is a pretty good idea. I think the original, like the people who made the original play too, like we said before, were people who, um, uh, were in actual Stalag 17, like yeah. the actual prison in the hey, actual war. Question, I didn't time. look this up, but is this is a completely different story than The Great Escape, right? Because the opening scene of this, where they escape under the uh, boiler... This, um, is, this is a different story than The Great Escape, but it was a very similar way to so escape. similar. And they, they talk about a lot of the similar stuff, too. Like, the Gen Geneva Convention was in effect at this point in time, and uh -huh. there were Geneva inspectors from Switzerland, and you had to follow all these rules, although obviously everyone skirted all the rules. And it was basically expected for these people to try to escape. Like, that, that was essentially your, your objective was to either escape and thereby become an active soldier again, or to uh, expend enemy resources by trying to keep you locked up. So essentially you were going to be such a problem to keep under lock and key in this prison that uh, the German army had to expend more resources to keep you in that prison and thereby detract from the resources that they commit could commit to directly fighting the allies. Right. Um, and you, you see that in here, a little less grand strategy in this one than in the great escape. Um, but it, and definitely not quite on the same epic scale and obviously not in color. Um, but this one kind of is like, what if film noir, but there, cause you have all these hopeful people and then you have like this one cynic played by William Holden, who yeah. I just love. Uh, I just love that there's a cynical guy. Cause I have a feeling that in that situation, that might be me where I'm like, <laughs> yeah, what are you guys trying to do? I'm just going to sit here with my cigar. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing is like, again, talking about blending comedy and drama. Um, so this one and in, uh, the apartment too. these two are the most like split, like there are really heavy things happening, but there's also a lot of lightness like the, it, we we're there's able very to kind long of just comedy sequences in this movie. Yeah. Billy Water kind of juggles the two here. So we'll we'll have like moments of the the intrigue and the mystery. And then we'll have here's here's like wacky life in in the Stalags. Yeah. Uh, which almost part, felt a little bit like when we talked about the great dictator and we were like, eh, some of it is a little like too light for world war two stuff. Now in the great dictator, yeah. we didn't quite know, but here it's like, it, it almost gets to that point, but not quite, but you're like the, the Nazis are like buffoonish rather than, uh, like hardened evil kind of characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of feels a little bit like that old show Hogan's Heroes, which was set in a POW camp 
I with, think it was almost it, based on this. From it's Wikipedia. almost based on this. It feels very similar to it, doesn't it? Um, yeah. But but yeah, it also I think it there's part of it the super light. There's also part of it too because you have that really buffoonish like Nazi who has to come in and is like, oh, I'm but I am your friend. Yeah. Um, all the time, but he's also the one like contacting the spy inside the barracks. So it, it's kind of like, oh yeah, he's all goofy and stuff, but that's just just an act because he's right. He, it's a cover because he's, he's doing his thing. Almost too much. The the only I think the part in here where it is too much for me is where we spend one really long segment, um, where animal and his buddy his buddy like puts it a dresses wig on up as, as uh betty grable uh, yeah betty grable um and then animal like loses his mind or something like it like it just that that scene that, isn't bad it just lasts for like 10 minutes yeah um, that one did cross the line for me too and that's it, an important it's like it's it's kind of an important moment because this is right after or maybe it is the scene where holden um Holden's figures character out. finds out who the guy is, and now he's like yeah. just trying to figure out what to do about it. Yeah, because all, yeah. all everyone's guards down for the party. But our comic yeah. relief go a little over the top in that scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just if they had cut it to like half the length, or like they made the joke like oh, one too many times too. Yeah. Like I don't know. Like they just kept going over and over and over it, and then I was like, oh man. Also. The, okay, but the best joke in the film the, is, it was, are you talking about the guy it. with the letter? Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I did not catch that the first time either. Oh, really? But it's so funny. It's so funny when I watched it this time that I caught it because it's, it's a guy. So essentially, it's a guy who gets a letter from his wife who's like, um, who tells him that, uh, oh my gosh, I found a baby on our doorstep. And wouldn't you believe it? I, it has my eyes. Um, you'll never believe and, it and he's like i believe it <laughs> very it's very obvious that she uh uh got pregnant while he was in the war and had this baby um and he's just like telling himself that he believes it he's blocking so, it out but it's, it's the it most out. understated joke in the whole thing and it comes up like three times but it's so funny because it's, so it's just funny. this guy like in his own world like i believe it i believe it i don't know why she doesn't think i believe it i believe it <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. This movie is also really weird to watch coming off of watching all of uh, the human condition films. Um, oh, yeah, because, again, it's, the, lots it's of the similar lightness. settings. Yeah, it's really weird. Uh, but, yeah, it's a really good mystery. It's very simple. There's not a whole lot of twists and turns. It's very, very, very simple. Essentially, one dude doesn't care. No one else can figure out the mystery, but the one dude who's cynical enough to figure out the mystery the one dude who has the superpower of not trusting everyone in the barracks um, actually um, to suss it out, actually gets pushed far enough to suss it out, yeah. figures it out. And then once he once he brings it up to like no one doubts him, like they almost immediately all believe him. Um, and he's he right, does, of course, yeah, he does prove it. But um, yeah, there there's there are some really like clever plot moments, like when um, they're going to get the colonel out with their smoke bomb and they're they need to keep uh william holden in the stylog because they don't want him they think he's the informant and they don't want him to find out how they're going to do it and so holden gets the real informant the german to be the one to guard him in the camp uh and so they he actually doesn't know but Everyone thinks that the reason that their plan pu got pulled off is because Holden was in the barracks, not because the other guy was in the barrack. Um, so there, there are some really clever plot uh, moments like that in there. Oh, yeah. It's very it's very clever, but very simple. It's not like a super twisty turny. Oh, shoot. I uh, just remembered my other favorite mystery. joke. Um, the the part where um, the Stalag commander, Otto Preminger's character, is talking on the phone with one of the SS leaders and they've got the current, the American Colonel who had sabotaged something in custody and they figured out that he's the one that did it. And his, his assistant comes while he's talking on the phone and puts his boots on. And while he's talking on the phone, he finishes the conversation and says, Heil Hitler and clicks his heels together and then immediately sits down and puts his, takes his shoes off again. <laughs> like he put his shoes on just to Heil on the phone. Oh, it's oh my gosh. Super subtle. Uh, so, back backstory on this film. Um, 
when this film was released, Paramount sent uh, Wilder a letter and they were like, hey, we need you to reshoot the ending scene and make the informant Polish because we don't think that the Germans are going to like this film very much if we make the bad guy a German and a Nazi and call him out on it. Um, there are already- guys. Bad German guys in the movie. Yeah, and uh, Billy Wilder was not very happy about this. He sent a letter back basically with an ultimatum that said, um, or he sent it to his agent or something and said, hey, this is ridiculous. Uh, If you don't get some clarification or just straight up apologize, Billy Wilder himself being Polish, you can't make a film about how evil the Nazis are and then make the bad guy Polish. Like, that is the most ridiculous request, and so that sounds like, like a Hollywood request, though. Oh gosh, it's just so dumb. But he was like, "If if y'all don't apologize or change this, uh, then I'm walking." And he was still contracted to make three more films for Paramount, and he never got any response. He was a money maker too. Yeah. So he packed his bags and he never worked at Paramount again. Um, and he took uh William Holden with him, and uh. That that just like is the most ridiculous thing. Why would they do that? So I think Studio the film heads, that man. we have is the only one that there is, thankfully. Um, but there was almost like this, oh my gosh, insane. Like of all the ridiculous like whitewashing to do, that is pretty pretty far up there. Yeah, that's uh that's something special. Uh and, and especially nasty. They yeah. uh yeah. I mean, Hollywood head, Hollywood studio heads are not the best. I mean, the, the best explanation for it, if you're ever like confused about it, is that they're just people with money. They're they're not actual Trying creatives. To make more money, yeah. Yeah, they're not they're not experts on this at all. They're investors, um, and sometimes like they have stupid requests. Or anybody who works with a client, you, clients have stupid requests all the time. <laughs> this sounds like a client request, like if there ever was one, and I don't. I mean, obviously, like, I don't blame uh, Billy Wilder for not choosing to work there again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else about Style like 17? There's a lot of well, like, you do great... have something you, you do know. have something here about Preminger not being able to remember his lines. Yeah, that that was another funny thing, because, again, Preminger is a famous director in his own right and was at this point. And uh, Billy Wilder was like he could never remember his lines when he was on set. And he's um He's kind of the the big bad guy in the film. Um, he doesn't have a lot of lines, but apparently he needed help remembering them constantly. Um, Billy Wilder has lots of stories of uh, people who were difficult to work with, um, and we're not even covering Marilyn Monroe this week. So, oh yeah, but <laughs> Marilyn Monroe was a mess on some like a high. I and I the more I, the, there's a lot of discourse on that particular story. The more I look into it, the more I don't. I think that uh, she wasn't at fault, and that her acting coaches were at fault. Uh, but but yeah, that was a mess of a movie to make. It's a really yeah. good movie, but a mess of the movie to make. Yeah, there are uh, actually two movies. I think she. I mean, I think this was const- her her life constantly. But you know, she had messy personal stuff happening at the same time. But Billy Wilder said, like an um like a a uh, unreliable person you can kind of depend on to be unreliable uh, and you can work around it. But Marilyn Monroe was apparently just unpredictable. Like sometimes she would be on it and she would have like eight pages of dialogue memorized and other times they would take 30 takes on one single line that she could just not nail. Uh, he was like, I, I just did not, never knew what to expect with her. Yeah, that that sounds like she was not the one in charge. Yeah, that sounds like she was... Her, the story of her life is is can it, this is really sad. It can often be broken down to segments of people using her, yeah, uh, for for different reasons or different things. But that seemed to be the case. She had a series of different acting coaches who all seemed to be using her for different things. Um, Not to I can't remember husbands. all of their names, but yeah. Husbands to uh, all sorts of stuff. It was it, it was it was not the not the best. So yeah. uh, we'll talk about so yeah, Monroe in a different episode. But just quick side note, because Billy Wilder did make two of the films that she is the most famous for, uh, Some Like It Hot and The Seven Year Itch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, All right, all right, let's move on. (laughs) 
to uh, on this already very long episode I know. to uh to, to Sabrina from 1954 with uh Jonathan's favorite Hepburn. Jason, take it away. Sabrina from 1954. Sabrina Fairchild is the daughter of the chauffeur of the wealthy tycoon Larrabee family, and she is desperately in love with the younger Larrabee brother, David. But David is a cad who's blown through multiple marriages and even more women, so her father sends Sabrina off to France to become a highly trained chef and to hopefully shake this troubling infatuation. But upon her return, Sabrina still loves David, and now that she's a sophisticated woman of the world, David turns his hound's eyes on her. Of course, David is set to marry the daughter of another tycoon family and complete a merger for his older, serious, all-business brother Linus Larrabee. Linus can't let the merger fall apart, and so steps in to woo Sabrina himself and lure her into returning to Paris. But the charade of falling in love soon finds itself turning into the real thing. So one of the most interesting parts about this movie, and I think one of the things that actually kind of makes it work, is uh, casting Humphrey Bogart against type. Um, Mm -hmm. Because he was, you know, he was Mr. Noir, Mr. Crime drama, right? And in this movie, he's a romantic lead. But the thing is, he's not an intentional romantic lead in this movie. This character isn't intentionally romantic and is actually yeah. it's not very specifically Casablanca kind of where like he's getting drunk anti-romantic. over his lost love like yeah. every night. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. He's just a busy businessman who doesn't have time for love and then accidentally falls in love. Yeah. Um, which makes it like is he he actually fits the role really well. Um a bit of beside uh, behind the scenes info though is that he was not happy about this movie. Um, and Bogart was also like a notorious alcoholic. And I don't think he was, uh, I think he was also not either not with or away from Lauren Bacall at this point. Uh, they had a really, really, really good marriage that did not last very long because Bogart died. Uh, but she was like one of the That'll few that it. could actually calm him down. Um, and, and actually kind of like make him like happy and like a pleasant person to be around. But apparently Bogart was kind of on a bender and not near Bacall at this point. So he, he was just an asshole to everybody. Um, especially Audrey Hepburn. But after the fact, he actually kind of came to his senses and apologized to everyone in a day and age where celebrities didn't really apologize for things. So that was actually an interesting story behind the scenes here. Yeah. Billy Uh, Wilder talks about that too, that they, they didn't get along very well, but then they they kind of made up for it later. But unfortunately, it was also around the time that uh, Bogart was was dying, and so they kind of they kind of made it up. But it they didn't have like a lot of work together um, during their careers. Yeah, yeah. But this is a really interesting movie, and it's one of the earliest in um, Audrey Hepburn's uh, canon. Yeah, she's so young. And the next yeah, one, the one we're going to talk about next time, uh, I, I always also, put the two of them together, these two films. It makes a lot of sense, honestly. It's her first two giant romantic leads is yeah. uh, Sabrina and Roman Holiday. So, like, it makes sense. It's kind of nice that they go back to back together. Um, it's also nice that we're talking about them now because we've already talked about some of her work in uh, kind of newer Hollywood, <clears throat> mm-hmm. like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's and stuff. But uh, this is kind of her work in an older romantic uh, Hollywood uh, the more classical system in the fifties with Audrey Sabrina Hepburn might be getting up there. And one of the most talked about actors, we need to do a, a tally on actors that we've talked about the most. Um, Cause even we in, should, like, we should hire someone else to do that tally. <laughs> uh, so any of our uh, filming fans can go back and we have a handy list of all the films we've talked about. I bet there's an app that we could just plug them all in and see like who are all the most common actors but we oh, did talk can. about Audrey Hepburn's last film in our first episode uh, when we talked about Always, um, which, wow, I almost forgot about that movie. Um, but yeah, Sabrina is is very charming and it's very Lubitschian. Like this film is where uh, Billy Wilder's like upbringing with writing for Ernst Lubitsch really comes through because there's so yeah. much implied there's so much um, that's like like the way that Billy Wilder puts it is, um, uh, you know, well, first of all, he says people say that I that I direct like Lubitsch, but it's it's like Lubitsch, but it's not Lubitsch because you can't really emulate Lubitsch. But he says, like in in most films, this is the way Billy Billy Wilder describes it. 
the director will tell you two plus two equals four, or they'll tell you one, uh, one and one and two is four, or they'll tell you one and one and one and one is four. Uh, but Lubitsch just says two and two, and the audience has to make four. Um, and that's, that's kind of a lot of what happens uh, with, because the, there's a lot of um, like scandalousness that happens, but it's all like off screen. There's uh, a shot where we're learning that uh, William Holden's character is um, a flirt and a womanizer, and he like a complete cad, a complete cad, and he seduces this woman to go back, like in the middle of a big party, to go back to the tennis courts that are abandoned uh, on their big family estate, and they have this like flirty thing across the the tennis net, and then he like smacks the end of the tennis net, and it just drops, and you're like, oh. We're saying something here, aren't we? Um, and this is Audrey Hepburn learning the character of the man that she's in love with, but she doesn't care because she's so in love with him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or like the signal of uh, broken champagne. How many champagne glasses you're holding? Champagne glasses are hilarious. There's also or, a story the about that cham- where yeah. Billy Wilder says he tried to replicate the champagne glass thing and he couldn't do it because... For some reason, like the way that it sits in your pocket, like you don't end up sitting on the champagne glasses. He was like, I could never make it happen. Uh, But all you have to do is add a sound effect and the audience will believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really all you have to do, right? It's hilarious, Uh, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was really funny. And the fact that William Holmes' character is held up in a hammock. um, With With a butthole cut out of it. Yeah. No, it's really, really, really funny. Gosh, He's a butthole. It's perfect. I just realized this. Yep. (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, the whole movie's implication. I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly, like, crackling, like, cracklingly, like, unique besides the casting of, like, Bogart and, uh, Audrey Hepburn against one another. It's just maybe, like, one of the best examples of, like, really solid romantic filmmaking from this era. And maybe one that you don't, like, I don't think it comes up in a lot of discussions of, like, the best romances of the era, but it definitely is like a really good example. And if that's your bag or if you're starting to explore like classic Hollywood romant- romantic m- movies, this is probably a pretty good example. Yeah. Or again, um, like where it does come up is in uh, lists of like Audrey Hepburn's classic films and stuff like that. So uh, if you, you know, if you like any of these actors, this is a great showcase for all of them, even though Humphrey Bogart was not particularly interested he still gives a great performance um there's uh oh my gosh there's some there's some fun performances in here with like the dad who's constantly like smoking the largest cigar i've ever seen in my life um oh my gosh he's such a bumbling nut like but there's also like this really old 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 world kind of thing happening um which we've talked about is one of the charms of golden age filmmaking but there's like this uh and this is actually part of the whole film is like this this classism uh that is separating all the characters and this is like literally the driving plot point is that sabrina is the daughter of the um chauffeur and the chauffeur has a very strict uh idea of you know who belongs where along with the the parents but the parents are just bumbling idiots but the (laughs) but the dad is like uh, sir, please do not ask me to drive you to take my daughter out on dates. It's rather uncomfortable. And you're like, yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah, makes sense. That guy, um, the dad was actually in To Catch a Thief and Dial In for Murder and Witness for the Prosecution. That guy is a great character actor. Yeah, man. Character actors are often some of the, I mean, well, they almost always are the most prolific people in Hollywood. Um, some of the most memorable performances. Yep. Not a bad. It's not a bad bag to have uh, yeah. to be a character actor. Oh, and this is we should say that I think we mentioned it before, but this is another one of those movies that was uh, not really written <laughs> entirely before they started. They just kind of like had part of it, and they were like, "Let's go, let's wing it." There's it's also, also structured really... kind of around a mystery, except we know the mystery, the solution to the mystery. Um, and then our characters are kind of piecing it together as we watch them yeah. piece it together. And this one is fun because Holden's character is, he is the cad, but he gets to redeem himself at the end. Like this one is like a solid feel good, uh, 
kind of ending. Like everything works itself out. Yeah, with the um, complete impossible, complete change of character <laughs> that you don't see in real life, but you do see in Hollywood. But it it works, and you love to you love to go along for the ride. You love I to will see, say you love to see it. I will say a uh, note on the um, directing by the seat of your pants. This one is is probably the most improvised. Wilder said that he would like write write the pages like five or eight pages um, the night before and then show up and shoot them. Um, but he said one day he had only been able to get like one or two pages done. And he was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't have enough to shoot for a whole day. And he told the only person he told this to was Audrey Hepburn. And so she would like stall by messing up her lines and like, and he would shoot the scene from like five different angles, which is not something he would usually do. He was usually, um, uh, kind of contrary to typical he strikes me as an economical kind of guy when it comes to shooting yeah which in, in the era you would shoot your master shot which is everything and then you would shoot your close-up for the whole scene and you would shoot your close-up from the other side and you would do shoot all the things and then piece it all together in the edit but he would shoot you know mostly stay wide and you know get a close-up when he needed to but he only shot what he needed so he didn't have to do that's a the way lot to of do editing. it um, That's a consistent thing we see across all of the best directors is that they do not overshoot on coverage. Oh, yeah. They know what they want and they get it and they don't bother with anything else. Oh, yeah. Or they like will actively sabotage any attempt to get John, you, extra you mean John shots. Ford? <laughs> yeah. Ford. John Ford literally just covering covering the lens when he didn't want. They were rolling, but he didn't yeah. want something to end up in the cut. And he was like, those people in Hollywood are going to frick this up. We I think Hitchcock would do that kind of thing, too. Um, yeah, I believe it. I believe it. If you know what, what works in a movie, you don't need to shoot anything else. Right. Um, but yeah, so Audrey Hepburn would basically stall for him. And then she like ended the day early uh, because he was out of stuff to to shoot. And she was like, oh, I just have such a headache. I need to stop. And he was like, she just did that for me because she knew that I didn't have enough to shoot for the day. So that's just a fun behind the scenes story. Fun little thing. Fun little Audrey thing. Audrey Hepburn being the great the greatest all right so let's move on to the apartment from 1960 jason take it away the apartment from 1960 cc bud baxter is a lonely office man at a new york insurance firm but he's got one thing going for him in return for promises of promotion he lends the key to his apartment to various bosses around the departments of his firm his bosses take women, not their wives, of course, to the apartment for entertainment purposes. He might have to sleep on the street half the time, but that's okay, because Bud will soon have made it at the firm with the help of these powerful men. And the day comes when he meets the married Mr. Sheldrake, a man who can give him that promotion. All Bud has to do is lend him the key to his place, and so he does. Sheldrake even gives him tickets to the Music Man on Broadway, and Bud asks out the elevator girl he fancies, Miss Kubelik who agrees, but stands him up. She had to meet with Sheldrake secretly at Bud's apartment to discuss the future of their affair. Without realizing it, Bud and Miss Kubelik, both being used by Mr. Sheldrake, are on a collision course that leads to one fateful Christmas Eve. Oh man, the apartment is, is so much. It's, it's so heavy, but it's so fun at the same time. Like it's, ah, uh, there's so it's much. Lot. There's so much. It's a lot. It's a, it's a dense movie. There's a lot going on in it. There's like, um, th there's, I mean, there's so many stories that are kind of like happening apart from each other that collide together. Um, I mean, you couldn't do a movie these days that's almost this dense. It would almost at least end up being like a mini series, if not a full on series, uh, with all the different storylines going on. If not a full on series, it's really good. It's really good. And, for a movie about adultery, it actually, uh, Wilder had wanted to make one for a while, but he wasn't able to make one until 1960 because of his constant push with, um, uh, with the censors. I mean, you could argue that Double Indemnity is kind of an affair movie, but it, it, it's, it's implied. But, and really? also like the guy dies at the end. So <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. there's, there's also, the cosmic justice that is always needed if you're going to show yeah. a character like that. But there are a lot yeah. of adulterers in this film that do not die. Yeah. And it's also, I, I will say almost all of the adultery is implied. Uh, it's almost all symbolized by a key. In fact, most of the movie hangs around the key or the idea of the apartment. Um, when I realized this, that, I really am uncomfortable with the poster of this film. I'm I mean, just throw it's, that out 
it just it, it just is what it is. It like it sums up the it sums up the idea. But I love every um, I love almost everything about this movie. I love Jack Lemmon's character, who's just like this. He he's just a fool more than anything yeah. else. He's like a nice fool. Like he's he's from out of town. He's from a small vill- a small like town. He doesn't understand. He thinks he's playing the game, but he's really being taken advantage of. Which that lines up with most people who I know who move from a small place to a big city. Um, and, and lines up with it, Shirley MacLaine's character. Shirley MacLaine's character falls very closely into the same category. It's nice to see uh, Shirley MacLaine in this movie as well. She's really good. And this is really close to the uh, start, if not the actual start of her career, I believe. Like, I don't uh, think no. she was. You know what the first film that she was in that I just realized when I looked up her IMDb? The what? Trouble with Harry by Alfred Hitchcock. His ridiculous murder comedy. Oh yeah, what a wacky movie. That was a wacky uh, movie. But yeah, I love. I anyway, yeah, I'll keep saying it. But I love the apartment. I love the uh, insane shot of all of the clerks at their desks because they're all just doing the same, like uh, Metropolis style. Like this is people compare uh, Wilder to Lang just because they're both German. But that is a very Langian setup uh, at the beginning. It is one. It's all done in forced perspective. So a lot of the mm-hmm. they just use smaller people and smaller desks to uh, make the room look bigger than it is. Um, as you go further back, uh, I will also say it also reminds me very much of a scene uh, and setup in a old 1920s silent movie by, by uh, King Vidor called The Crowd, in which a character is also stuck working at a company with five million desks all laid out in a perfect row. Um, while his personal life falls apart. Um, huh. But that was in like 1920. I am sure Wilder is aware of that. I do think it was, I think it was a pretty strong inspiration for that. Uh, but the whole office scenario of the constant affairs and backstabbing and using of subordinates in various ways is basically that's a big part of the setup for Mad Men. Um, which I don't know if you've watched that series, Jonathan. It's very good, um, but it is heavily inspired by this movie and other 60s movies. Uh, but if you watch Mad Men and watch this movie, you'll, you can see how the two could be connected. Um, mm-hmm. I I do dig that almost, almost everything here is done with just heavy implication. Like you were saying, where they just say two plus two and the audience figures it out. I, that's a very strong aspect of this movie. I don't think they ever really directly say that anyone's having an affair here. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is so It's just blatant. so obvious yeah. that like you don't have to say it. Yeah, there's there's zero gray area, but it is it's all just shown through uh leaving shots and oh, your lady friend left this at my apartment or Oh, I cleaned the couch and I found twelve pairs of earrings and lipstick. Uh, like, or like when the doctor asked to study um, Jack Lemmon's body after okay. he dies, <laughs> okay. because he's like, "Wow, you have such a robust constitution." This is the oh man. This is the only thing that really bothers me about the about Jack Lemmon's character, particularly, is that he is such a uh, pushover. Uh, not even that. It's, it's just the fact that he goes along with everything. Like he doesn't care. Like he's, he's the only one like doing the right thing, but he doesn't care that everyone thinks that he's doing like the worst thing or at least his neighbors and stuff. Um, and I I, think he's a hundred percent bought into the idea of what he's doing. will get him ahead. I I, I think that's, I think that's true, but I feel like that wasn't like there's, and again, this is a dense movie, so there's not time to develop everything. But I feel like even from the beginning, he's so like frustrated with his whole arrangement with his bosses that the uh, the motivation of the um, the raise or the the moving up the ladder doesn't seem like as urgent or as felt like he's not constantly like, well, if I do that, then I'm not going to get my promotion or like, we don't know what the promotion is going to do for him, except that that's just like the thing you get the promotion. The promotion is the MacGuffin, but I don't know. I felt like it needed more. Maybe that's just cause we're in an era where people change jobs a lot more than they used to. And so like promotion used to just be I think, the thing. That's I think all you have less culturally predominant yeah. as it used to be for sure. I think 
I think it is also kind of like, um, although on a very different wavelength, I think kind of like the show The Office, it's documenting like a snippet of office culture from a certain point in time. And I think in that, in, in the 60s, you know, it was driven by oh promotion. Gosh. Is The Office you know, documenting our current office culture? I, I think it's, <laughs> I think we're past it, actually. I think uh, The Office documented the office culture of the past 20 years. And now after the pandemic, we're in something totally new. Um, what that is, I don't entirely know, but I do know that people are less obsessed with promotion. Um, people yeah. are more, uh, more intent on individual success or What's growth. What's going to be the office of like the that. gig economy? That's the real question. Uh, I mean, there's definitely been attempts at it. I wouldn't say that there's been good attempts at it, but there have been attempts at it. So, um, I don't know, maybe someone will, uh, will figure that one out, but I do think that's a cultural thing. And I do think it's something that, um, I think something that could that could help that along actually without wasting time on it because honestly you would you would have to spend some time at the beginning. Uh, it almost feels like part of the writing process is always like where do we begin the story and maybe the original concept for the story begins with how this guy ended up in the situation in the first place. Right. But they decided that the more interesting part isn't oh how did this guy end up in the situation in this first place? How how does it how does it end? How does this fall apart? Once we get into the romantic stuff and by spending time there, we get more time to develop Shirley MacLaine's character and the crappy Sheldrake's his character. Wow. Yeah. I just remembered his name. Crazy. Um, Sheldrake being played by the main guy from double indemnity. Um, yes. But so, so I will say Shirley MacLaine's character is one of the things that kind of helps me, uh, palette Jack Lemon's character because her character is one of, being in a uh, manipulative and, you know, like not physically but psychologically abusive relationship um, and yet still being stuck in it and drawn to it just kind of from her own personal desire, uh, which I think is kind of mirrored in Jack Lemmon. He's like he's stuck in this job and he can't break away from it because it's kind of like the only thing that he has. It's all he he wants and she's in the same thing where she will hold on to any promise that Sheldrake gives her, um, even though he's never followed through on it. And it gets frustrating um, as you watch her just constantly um, get get duped by him over and over again. And yet the thing that that hits me about this film is that it's so real. Like I've I've known people in those kinds of relationships and you you are very frustrated, but you can't like. You can't pull them out of it unless they make that decision. Nah, they or like have to something, be, yeah, they have to come something to that decision to on their own. Um, you, can't, you can't force it. Otherwise, they, they, you, you become the enemy I, in that situation. Yeah. yeah, But it's so hard to watch. But that's how I felt for this whole movie. Like, it's just really hard to watch. And that's that's the situation that Jack Lemmon's character is in. He's there. He's he's trying to do the right thing, but he can't he can't do anything to stop it or to help her um, mm -hmm. once he figures out what's going on. Um, except to once he realizes that he's aiding and abetting to completely stop it. And that's that's the decision that he ultimately has to make, um, which uh, is makes for an extremely satisfying ending. But it's it's kind of excruciating to get a there. Very satisfying ending. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But it's a it's a really, really, really. Um, uh, but like you said, you were saying it's a very real story even though it's heightened up and it's it's played out like maybe a little too perfectly here and there except it's not even because like even goes so haywire that her like brother-in-law comes and punches jack lemon in yeah. the face because he won't he won't stand he, he won't, won't tell them that it's not yeah. him he won't tell anyone yeah. that it's not him yeah he's too scared of what would happen if he says no i think that was the, um, that's the only thing that would have made it more satisfying is if the doctor like realized oh you haven't been doing this every night. <laughs> it's been. I think the doctor. I think the doctor realized that pretty fast. Actually, I. I think. I think the doctor clues in pretty quickly. I didn't see it the first time, but I think by the time that the. Um, uh, the the uh, the brother in law comes and punches him. I think the doctors realized that it wasn't Jack Lemmon's character. Who Maybe that's was, that's pretty late, but yeah, I think that's probably because the next time we see him is when he invites him to the party. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, probably I think by, right. I think definitely by the time he invites him to the party, he knows right. that it's not actually him. His wife never figures it out, and his wife his wife just 
bust Jack Lemmon's balls the entire time. They're, they're sure. a great pair. <laughs> so funny. Oh, man. So, speaking of them, though, uh, can we talk about how misleading the marketing for this movie is? Uh, oh, I mean, what what marketing? What do you think? What, what so did I watched you, uh, the trailer? This is the first time that I've actually watched the oh, film. Oh, you watched I've the trailer? A lot about it, but the trailer makes it look like this is a film about Jack Lemmon having a bunch of affairs in his apartment because all it shows is the neighbors' reactions to joke. him. I know, <laughs> I it's, but it's so joke. misleading and hilarious. <laughs> oh man, that's because really Jack Lemmon funny. is the only one who doesn't. Uh, he's literally yeah. the only. Well, actually, he tries to once, but that doesn't work out very well. Um, nah, nah, nah. Uh, I will say though, the one time he does is like, it, it, it's like actually completely consenting, in in like this really, like weirdly refreshing yeah. way. Com- at least on a comparative scale to everyone else. Um, and right, it's still a bad situation because the, the lady's married, but it's like the most like ridiculous setup. Yeah, isn't like I can't remember exactly, but isn't her husband like in a jail in he's Shanghai a- or something? Like it's something wacky. Like it's it's really I think weird. he's like in Mexico, but yeah, he's like locked up and And then she's not and then we, <laughs> when he kicks her out, she tells him that he'll she'll tell her a husband about this. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, this is Oh man. Again, this is this is Wilder channeling his Lubitsch to the fullest because even Lubitsch never made a film this blatant about uh, oh, an he affair. Couldn't. He got close. He, he got couldn't. pretty he got close really a couple close. times. Yeah, he did. But, but he, he couldn't in the blatant. era that he was working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Billy Billy Wilder, though, did it with this one. This one is, I, is on the AFI Top 100, and it's one of the ones that I think is most deserving of being in a Top 100 list uh, of, like, capturing a certain era of humor and reality as well as being like partially a time capsule for the era in which it was, it was created. Like it's just, it's just really good. And it's also being ones. timeless again in like the fact that these types of relationships are things that people fall into all the time. Like no oh, matter this when, this is really, really real when it's yeah. set. Yeah. This is really, really real. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. We actually have two on the AFI top 100 because we have sunset Boulevard today as well. Oh yeah. Uh, we sunset have two Boulevard of the all time, like almost best movies ever made. Shoe in. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think when you talk about the top 100 movies, uh, then you're talking about something that might be a little too subjective from person to person. But when we talk about like a thousand movies to see before you die, both of these movies should be on that list. Like, yeah. just, go watch them. And they're also like, we, when, especially when we talk about these older movies, like anything before like 19. Uh, oh, crap. At this point, it's probably the 80s too. anything before the 90s is really easy to find. You can rent it on Amazon or YouTube for like three or four bucks. Easy. Yeah. You could find all of these there easily. So I, I highly and recommend it as long as you got the bandwidth to spend like a little bit of cash on it. Like go check them out. It's a nice afternoon entertainment. Not to mention well to watching. plug basically the only streaming service that Alex and I still have criterion channel has a collection of five Billy Wilder films with all four of these plus ACE in the yeah. hole. Which could it be its own up podcast. Perfectly. Which um, I also watched, which was great. It was oh, it's it so good. good. Uh, last last thing about the apartment, which is a nitpick, but are you ready for the dirtiest trick that Billy Wilder pulls in this movie? Go for it. <laughs> in the last forty five seconds, when Shirley MacLaine runs to Jack Lemmon's apartment for the last time, and he pulls the stinking gunshot sound effect. Oh yeah, that's the dirtiest yeah, yeah, yeah. trick. <laughs> because first yeah, he of, okay. just like popped a cork. He, yeah. So the joke is that first of all, only the audience has seen Jack Lemmon pull out uh, this pistol, which he had talked about earlier in the in the film, and then yeah, he, Shirley MacLaine comes about, yeah. in and she hears a popping sound, which is a straight up gun sound effect. But the joke is that he just popped a, a bottle of champagne. But the audience is supposed to think that he offed himself after everything that's gone on. Um, but it's like, like she didn't know that he had the gun. He talked about the gun, but she never saw it. Um, and she's like, she's like screaming though. And like, just like this one last little tug on the heartstrings that Billy Wilder has to just slide in there at the very end. Um, but at that point you're just, you're all for it because once you see Shirley MacLaine, like running down the street in the snow, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm for this. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's it's almost like one of those things where every time I've watched this movie, I'm like, oh, that's stupid. But uh, it's also like so stupid that when you register it as stupid as an audience member, it gives you a sense of relief. And it's very akin to the sense of relief that you're supposed to be feeling at that moment. Yeah. He's basically like, oh, it stupid. at that point. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, it's definitely a little dirty, but like it gets the it gets you where you need to go. So, yeah. All right, Jonathan, let's slide on in to overall notes. Yeah, let's do it. Um, let me, while you talk about overall notes, I'm going to narrate your commentary. <laughs> okay, let's talk Jonathan about narration. Jonathan laughs. So, he begins the conversation. So we have narration in Sunset Boulevard. We definitely had it in Double Indemnity. He starts talking that about Sunset Boulevard in Double classic. Indemnity. Um, I don't think it was in either of the other two. But the thing that Billy Wilder the other two films. Talks, <laughs> talks about for narration is... Because we've talked about narration on the podcast before and how it's typically like in a, you know, if we go back to adaptation and the Robert McKee like rules of screenwriting, uh, narration is a never do, basically. But yeah, it's considered that, fairly lazy. Yeah, but the way that Billy Wilder talks about it is you you can't use narration that says something that the audience already knows. The only thing that narration should do is add more to the scene. Um, so anything that is, that is being said is something that the audience is learning. It's not rehashing stuff and telling us what we already know because yeah. that's it just can't be ahead that's of insulting or to the audience. The, uh, yeah. the audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's essentially the, the way I, the way I've heard about it and the way it seems to be used in most uh, Billy Wilder, Wilder films to good effect is it's most effective as a tone setter. Yeah. Uh, and the thing I actually wonder about, I was wondering about while we were doing this podcast, Jonathan, is there's there's narration in Double Indemnity because Billy Wilder likes narration. Uh, but because there's narration in Double Indemnity, which kind of established the film noir genre, now there's considered to be narration in most film noir. It's a trope. So is yeah. there only is there only narration in film noir? So is it such a trope? Almost only. Or at least originally because Billy Wilder just likes narration. That that might be true. So in the in the documentary, uh, when Billy Wilder is talking about narration, they use clips from Double Indemnity. Um, so I was refreshed on it because I, I remember the narration, but I don't remember specifics. But there are moments where, like, uh, you know, again, the guy who plays uh, Shell Drake, Fred McMurray, is like driving down the street, and he's he's talking like, you know. Uh, as I drove, every time I drove down that street, I could smell the, you know, whatever the flowers were, the daffodils. Who knew that murder smelled like daffodils or something like that? So it's like adding texture that uh, you don't get through film, but you can describe it in a way that's kind of novelesque. And obviously, like Double Indemnity um, and some of the noirs are based on uh, novels by Raymond Chandler. Um, uh, who's the other guy that wrote um, Maltese Falcon? I don't remember. But uh, or the Thin Man, but they're based on novels, which can give you that kind of texture, and they're you know written that way. Um, yeah. But I do think you have a point, and I remember there's a there's a panel discussion with a bunch of fantasy writers, and at some point, um, uh, oh gosh, remind me, oh, I'm blanking on everything. Uh, the guy who wrote Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin. Yeah, George R. R. Martin was saying, um, "Don't worry, the Winds of Winter will come out any day." <laughs> Uh, he was saying that that fantasy novels tend to always have maps in them because Tolkien liked maps. Uh, he loved maps and he loved languages, and so he filled Gosh, I love a Lord map. of the Rings with that. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not a necessary part of fantasy. And I think it was it was either Brian uh, or Brandon Sanderson or maybe Patrick Rothfuss, um, but they were saying that you know they like. Uh, the idea of of money and and economy, and so they they build oh, in loves a that fantasy now. economy yeah. into their world. So it it is this thing where you know once someone kind of sets the tone for a genre, there are elements of that that kind of get picked up by default as it transfers down the line. But you have to kind of step back and think, what is the best elements to include for my story, or what are the best elements for my style of storytelling? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. A lot of storytelling and effective storytelling is just learning what your own tastes are and playing into them. Yeah. Um, it's one part self-discovery, learning your taste and what you like. So when we talk about watching like wide scopes of films and experiencing different genres and different creators, like that's part of that. Like it's, it's all about learning what you like and finding that and learning ways to combine it. And then the other part is just work, level grinding. Go out there, do it, do it a lot, and you'll get yeah. good at it. And if, if no one else is proof, then the working directors of classic Hollywood are 100% proof. They just did it a bunch and they got good at it. Oh, yeah. Especially these ones that like, you know, started... Billy Wilder didn't necessarily start in the silent era, but again, he came up with Ernst Lubitsch, who started in the silent era, and they were figuring out the rules of filmmaking. So they were like setting the groundwork for this stuff. And Billy Wilder's generation in the golden age, they're coming on the shoulders of those people and like under the direct tutelage of those people who built the film industry. So they have like and then, you know, right after the Golden Age, you have the 60s and the American New Wave, which is tearing down that foundation. Um, but these filmmakers in the Golden Age have kind of the strongest foundation of uh, research and learning on the people who had already experimented and tried out all the things and found out what works really solidly. And they were able to just pump out hit after hit. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing we don't talk about sometimes is that between all those hits, sometimes there's some duds. <laughs> but right. when, when you make enough movies, that's not a problem because you just get up and do the next one. Oftentimes you learn more by doing a bad f- film than you do by doing a good film. Absolutely. Uh, but it did seem like during the 50s and, and 60s uh, and a good chunk of the 40s that Billy Wilder could basically do no wrong. Yeah. Uh, there, did, like I said, we've, he, we've touched on for today we had double indemnity before um again some of the films he wrote for lubich uh but also ace in the hole um is a masterpiece uh the uh the monroe films um some like it hot and uh the seven, seven year, year itch. itch um the spirit of saint louis with jimmy stewart um he's got foreign affair uh a song is born uh which you mentioned earlier um Oh my gosh. Why? Did he write <laughs> That's uh, the point. Ocean's Why? 11? Apparently he's uncredited writer on Ocean's 11. Like he's interesting all over the place. Um yeah. Yeah, he's also a very good like fundamentals filmmaker. Like he's not super flashy or anything. He doesn't do like any or or Orson Welles-esque cinematography all over the place. He hated he's very that much stuff. just like back to basics very simple filmmaking but very effective filmmaking too and i've noticed that in his plots too they they there's mysteries and there's surprises and twists but there's never too much the idea was never quantity when it comes yeah. to came to the construction of his plots it was quality yeah and when he talks about about filmmaking and and uh cinematography he's like he describes it very crudely, but he's he says, uh, you know, those those types of shots like low angles and stuff where you're like cutting out a hole in the floor to shoot up, uh, which is a little jab at Orson Welles specifically, um, is just like the the director showing off and, and aggrandizing themselves. But once once the audience notices, oh, my gosh, what a cool shot, then he's like, you've lost like <laughs> like your picture's over. You're not in the movie anymore, um, which is funny because those are. Those are things that I really like about Orson Welles' uh, films, and that's you know one of the things that he's really known for, and he loved doing that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, what, uh, anything else to say about uh, Billy Wilder before we start talking about next time on the podcast, Jonathan? Yeah, so I think just, just like the last point to kind of uh, drive home is is like we've been talking about, he his films are all completely entertaining and uh, like hold together in their own right. But they also kind of have a, you know, subtle layer of, you know, jabbing at the audience uh, or jabbing at Hollywood or jabbing at, you know, certain, certain things. Uh, And he, he basically uh, calls this philosophy with a chocolate coating. So the way that he makes films like the apartment where he blends the, the intense drama of being in a really um, destructive relationship with the comedy of the bumbling idiot just trying to get ahead by doing whatever he can um, is is a way to make a point without uh, another thing that he says is like the, the audience doesn't want 
to go to a film and again, his words and leave feeling like he's been called a son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> so he was like, I'm trying to make points, but the harder you make a point, the less an audience is going to enjoy it. And I think he, I think he brought that up specifically with Ace in the Hole because that is a really scathing look at um, the media and consumerism, specifically the uh, the audience of the media that sensationalizes everything and um, you know can turn a Ace in the Hole out is so precious even even yeah. now. It's even, I think it's just going to like become more and more relevant. Like there's, yeah. there is no slowing in sight that it, that it seems. Yeah. 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 And through, through his work that is not overcomplicated, it seems, does seem like, um, while there was able to get at some like core basic features of hum- humanity just by like working, working yeah. down deep. Volker Schlondorf says, um, Schlondorf, <laughs> he says basically like, Wilder was able to find that way of of making points and telling stories that didn't feel uh, like he called his own filmmaking more more pretentious than Wilder's. The Wilder had it, but he didn't have this like intellectual like beat you over the head with it. He was able to, again, add that into just good storytelling and entertaining storytelling that keeps you watching while also speaking directly to you at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, Jonathan, next time on the podcast, what are we talking about? Who are next we talking time, about? We're talking about William Wyler, not Oh, you mean Billy, Billy Wilder? Wilder? No. <laughs> so William Wilder was, or, oh gosh, I just did it. So, <laughs> so William Wyler, uh, again, was working around the same era. Um, and I believe they were like friendly, if not friends. Yeah, they definitely, there is a story in one of their chapters of the AFI Convos book where they were introduced as the wrong person uh, to a uh, some kind of um, meeting or film festival or something. And it was just like super embarrassing for everybody involved. Um, but William Wyler made some very different films. Uh, and we're going to talk about his films, mostly post-war. Um, by the time after the war, he had kind of got into his swing and he was making some really, really big hits. Um, so we're going to talk about the best years of our lives from 1946, which is his war film or one of them. It's also the one that beat out, um, it's a wonderful life. Oh, interesting. Their titles yeah. are so similar too. Um, yep, 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 yep. Then we're going to talk about our next Audrey Hepburn film, Roman Holiday from 1953. Uh, and then we get to one of his epics, uh, still one of the greatest epics of all time, Ben-Hur from 1956. Man, for that one. That was long. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make some coffee. Um, And then we're going to talk about The Collector from 1965, which I think is a lot darker. I just know a little bit about it. Oh, it's so dark. It's about it's about a serial killer. I think it's it's on. I think it's on uh, Francois Truffaut's list of uh, films that are basically copying Hitchcock. (laughs) It's very it's it's very similar to it's very Hitchcockian. Um, and it actually feels like I remember when I watched it the first time, it feels like something that would be like a early 70s serial killer movie. It just came out a little bit ahead of that time. Yeah, that's um, what it, it seems like almost like a B movie, but it's interesting coming from William Wyler. So we'll see how that goes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it, it's 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 starting. It's just starting to touch upon that point, the long, slow shift where B movies became A movies. Um, where genre pieces <laughs> became mainstream and the idea of a drama film just as a drama film kind of died. Yeah. Not entirely, but mostly. So that's what we've got coming up next time. Uh, but if you'd like to support us in the meantime, you can uh, head over to Patreon. We have an account there and you can join our digital community on Discord and listen to us recording live um, and get our bonus podcast, which has bloopers and also talking about other films, some things that came out 100 years ago, like the latest episode that you can listen to right now, which was about Douglas Fairbanks in The Three Musketeers, produced by United Artists, which is just all kinds of early Hollywood uh, goodness. Um, And uh, yeah, we also talk about short films and new releases and stuff over there. So check it out if you are so inclined. That's about all the time we have for this episode. To find links to things that we talked about today, as well as a complete list of past episodes and all 403, Alex, films that we've covered so far, visit thefilmlinks.com.
That's quite a few. You can also join us for ongoing film discussions on our Discord server. And to stay posted about upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at The Filmlings. Summaries for each of the films this episode were recorded by me, Jason Harden. Find me online everywhere at the if Blue you like Jane, the show, 1994. Let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. By the way, Jonathan, have you ever been in a conversation where you talk about a movie from like the 80s or the 90s and somebody's like, yeah, I like I, I've seen that. I like old movies. And you just look at them <laughs> like they just like blasphemed or something. <laughs> On the flip side, I have had a conversation with someone where I mentioned an old movie and he knew about it and started talking about old movies that he had seen. And we both started having this like random cinephile conversation uh, and like we hadn't seen all the same movies, but we could all we could always like point to another film. It's like, oh, that's like this old movie. Oh, like so it was like it's like the positive side of that conversation.